You're listening to Ireland's Aviation Podcast. On this episode of Long Final from Scork 7000, we're in conversation with Dublin man D.V. O'Hanlon, retired air traffic controller, but still a familiar voice at fly-ins and air shows around Ireland, where he can be heard providing a local advisory service backed up with lots of patience and calm. He's also been a presence at multiple events, such as the Ryder Cup, where over 186 helicopters operated multiple flights, up to 600 a day back in 2006. The IA at the time told the Irish Times that this was more flights than on the busiest day at Dublin Airport. I started the chat by finding out about the man himself. I'm an inner city dub. dub Dublin won. If anybody knows the corner of Dorset Street and uh, Frederick Street, there's a pub at the corner. It used to be Cooks and Maguires. And then it became Maguires. I don't know who it is now, but I know um, Maguires' son inherited, obviously. This was sometime just when I was leaving Dublin or just after I left Dublin. The shop, my, my dad had a hairdresser shop right next. It's now an off license. It's now an off license. So it, it was quite close to the centre of the city. I mean, I remember my dad picking up my, uh, my oldest brother the time the pillar was blown up and uh, saying, uh, come on, Michael, the pillar is gone. Now, this is from, we just heard the shake of the boom. And he grabbed Michael and said, come on, the pillar is gone. So he had an inside track there. He, he, a lot of his friends now would have been members of the old IRA. So, you know, as, as children growing up, it's kind of Dublin in the rare old times, you know, where you played marbles in the gutters and... Uh, I think it, at, at the time that you're describing then, the idea that you would suddenly find yourself heading off to train as an air traffic controller, how did, how did that happen? As a youngster, I mean, obviously I played football and hurling and rowing, and I was also doing some Irish dancing. And uh, some of my friends from the Irish dancing, and they're both dead now, the poor devils, Liam Flanagan and Martin Gunning. But um, they, uh, Flanagan, he, he came across his ad in the paper for a Kuntor Real All Air Trap. Now, my Irish would be good because I spent three months in Sugaita, you know, fado, fado. I couldn't get my head around what the hell was it? What did he do? You know, I was thinking of jobs in the airport, so trucks around the place, an engineer doing a baggage check, anything like that. But I couldn't get my head around the Kuntoril all the air traffic. But the interview was uh, was down in the Civil Service Commission in, in O'Connell Street. And I remember going into, into the Civil Service Commission offices in, at the top of O'Connell Street, up, up near the, the, Adel- the, up near, yeah, the Adelphi. So up I went for the interview, and George McCutton, who was the, the, the chief uh, air traffic controller, and he was based in, in Dublin, and uh, our CEO, our, our senior officer here in, in Shannon, Mick Maloney, they were on the interview board. And at one stage, they asked me, no, Mr. Hanlon, can you tell me the difference between a, a jet engine and a, an ordinary engine? And I hadn't a clue. Now, I knew about cars, so that was an internal combustion engine, so I said, well, it's like this, uh, the ordinary propeller engine is an internal combustion engine. And the other one is the case of where it takes in air, compresses it, and shoots it out the back under pressure, which was basically correct, you know, but uh, I didn't know that at the time. But anyway, I got the job. <laughs> 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 I got the job anyway in Soviet, you know. But, uh, that's, it was uh, a pure fluke. And I remember my first day, I started in the blue room, what was then the blue room in Dublin. Yeah. The, the, the original tower, you know, you went up mm. through the, the, the building and you went in a door and you climbed more steps to the blue room. Um, but uh, that's going back into the, the, night, the 6th of July, 1970. 1970, uh, what, what was the process of training? Where did they train you first and, and, and what did they teach you? Well, training, uh, what did they teach us? Well, uh, the, the, from, from Dublin, um, I was in there about six weeks, kind of not doing a lot, just putting in time. You were learning a certain amount, but not an awful lot. You were putting in time to, to go to Cork and do your Abinicio course. And uh, your Abinicio course, you would do a certain amount of meteorology, ATC procedures, kind of, uh, not in any great detail. At the end of two years, then, you went for your end of, end of probation exam, which was another course, which was in more detail. And then sometime later on, you went to do your. Uh, you, you, after interviews, you were selected and sent forward for training as a controller, which now delved into the whole process of air traffic control an awful lot better than, than you know, more, more seriously than was done heretofore. Uh, so you would have done a lot of air law, 
we learned about indicated airspeed, true airspeed, uh, true airspeed you know, tracks and, and uh, you know, uh, all kinds of stuff, navigation problems. In other words, all of the language that you needed for the environment that you were in. You, you head off yes. down to Cork. What kind of aircraft would you have been handling in, in the early 1970s? It would have been a combination of, of turboprop and jets, mm-hmm. I suppose, wasn't it? Well, it, it was the early days of the jets. I mean, there were still 720s flying around the place. DC-8s were commonplace, stretched DC-8s. All that kind of stuff, and you had a lot of uh, there were those. It was a few viscounts around, a few stragglers of DC threes, and you know a lot of that type of stuff was coming and going. Tidville Way, Pan Am were still on the go, and uh, Sabina, uh, Lufthansa, well, they're still on the go. But you know, a lot of the older seaboard worlds were, were all on the go, and, and uh, things like that. But it was a good time to be in uh, doing that. But most of the control in those days was procedural control, and when we when I went to Shannon. It was procedural control with a radar backup. De- define that just for somebody who might not know. Procedural means that you were doing it by what? Time and... Uh, and, and, time, sp- and time, strips of time, paper. Strip, strips of paper, time and distance mm. and, and, and levels. Now, above uh, 29,000 feet, you had 2,000 feet vertically separated. Uh, you had two degrees going across the ocean, lateral separation, uh, 2,000 feet between, between them. And then... Sometime later, when was that? That would have been probably well into the 70s. Uh, they brought in what they called composite separation, which was kind of a thousand feet vertically and one degree laterally. So, uh, you know, if you fill it, one fella at, at, at 31,000 feet, the next fella adjacent to him would be at 32 or, or, or 300. So it was composite, of, uh, a, a bit of both. Uh, but, you know, and since then it, it went down to a thousand feet all over. And um, then the radar became. You know, when I started, there was a, you had a tracker ball, which you dropped onto this uh, slash on the radar screen. This slash could be 20 miles long. In the top right-hand corner of the radar screen, the assigned code was all that came up on the flight level. So that's how you identified the traffic. I gave him squawk in 2014, and up on the top right-hand corner came 2014, and at whatever, whatever flight level he was assigned, that's him. Now, when you compare that to, to today's episodes where constantly the signal is, is named for you, the, the call sign will be on it, his flight level, his point of departure and his destination, and he assigned tracks, if he's climbing or if he's descending, it's all within the label, all there. and the label is constant. I'm thinking of what I suppose might have been high tech, but might have been coming to the end of its life, uh, because it always fascinated me was precision approach radar. That was a particular skill. <laughs> well, there was a patter to it. You you, you spoke there in a was, particular way. You spoke actually. Uh, precision approach was gone before I. It was going out uh, when I was a young assistant. By the time I got to be a controller and had my, my other licenses or ratings, mm. that was gone. Yeah, ILSs were in and and. Um, uh, the, the navigation procedures and, and equipment was much uh, more accurate. But uh, you, you essentially, you were giving him one and two degree turns and you were watching him, watching him on the glide slope. So if he was deviating at all, you were giving, giving him very small turns. And essentially, you were talking nonstop. In certain cir- uh, circles, it was described as talking him, on, talking him down. But it was, a good, it was a good way to do it. And uh, in Shannon, you were... There was two radar uh, suites, and they were behind this big, heavy-duty, green, dark green curtain. And if you looked in there at these fellas, they'd see the light coming in, and they'd, they, they wouldn't be too shy about telling you to get the hell out. You know? They'd be sitting almost inside in the radar. You know, as, as an operational controller, the busier you got, you tended to lean in, in, into the scope and further into the scope. So if a fellow was hopping, he was stuck in the radar, you know. It was exciting, and you got to leave your work behind you when you went home. You, you didn't bring a bag home, but you were I, I was going to, to say that to you because, you know, the idea of people will often describe it as one of the high-pressure, high-stressed jobs. And, you know, uh, how, does, how do you switch off from that? Do you know that you're responsible for two aeroplanes with 300 people in, involved? If you think like that as a controller, you won't survive. It's a job. You're trained for it. You have two blips that are coming at each other that have to be separated at all costs. That's it. They have to be separated. So whether they're, you know, um, Cessna 150 coming coming hard at the Concorde or vice versa or any combination thereof in between, they just have to be separated. And you just do all you have. You're given the, you're given the radio. You're given the radar. You're given all sorts of other 
procedural tools that if one he doesn't have one or the other, you can yeah you know, use your best judgments to get one out of the way. You usually possess the one fifty out of the best <laughs> option. <True. laughs> that's the, it's like the story of the lighthouse and the battleship, isn't it? <laughs> one, Correct. One of them Correct. is an immovable object. <laughs> Did you get to know the the voices of the crews? I mean, would would it be like that that you would actually know the skippers and 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 the first officers? Yeah, but the problem with being an air traffic controller is you rarely ever get to meet these guys. Mm. Now, say for the likes of Jay Pardy, Angelo Cunningham, and a few others, Tom Davy was at the time was flying uh, started flying with Ryanair. You happened to be an air traffic controller before that, and a few other people you would meet them and you'd know them. But you know all the all, all the the, um, the people coming backwards and forwards across the ocean or in the ocean. You'd know their voices. You know the same with we'd know your voices might be common. We might never have seen you or met you, but listen to you on the radar. Oh, this might. The uh, average pilot will go through their entire career without ever issuing the phrase "mayday," but I'm sure a controller has, hears it several times in their career. Believe it or not, not very often. It's a it's a very distinct phrase, and I've only ever heard it once. Sorry, twice. I heard it once in Sligo when um, uh, a small home built job uh, went into the, the beach, and uh, this is subsequent to Arthur Wigno. And I heard it once when there was a, a light aircraft coming across the ocean and didn't do his point of no return che- fuel checks properly. End result was that the siphon effect from barrels to barrels back into the tanks wasn't working properly. He was a bit north of track, and in order to get the uh, fuel flowing, he was up at eight zero. Uh, he decided he'd do a dive to try and get the fuel flowing uh, uh, to us. Which we didn't see him until he was a. No, we were, uh, he didn't have transponder, so we didn't see him. He was about eighty miles west of us. In which case he was, well, he was appreciably north of track. As it, had he stayed on track, it was a rough night too, by the way. Had he stayed on track, he would have come in by loop head and he could have ditched the estuary. But he was north of track and he came in over the Iron Islands. And uh, I was on, it was late in the evening, it was probably about oh, probably half 11, half 11, just before midnight. We spent our time obviously talking to him and trying to keep him calm. Now he'd lost all his height because he tried to get it. You know, if I were to do it again, I, I just wouldn't let him. Do not, I said. But he flew in over the Iron Islands, and we had been onto the Iron Islands. There were three airfields in the Iron Islands at the time, and there was no lights. In but uh, I think it was in, in, his, in his man that were trying to uh, organise cars to light up the strip. And he flew over the northern side of it. As he passed by, he saw the cars beginning to assemble. And when he turned, the engine scuffed and into the water he went. And it was uh, over 30 metre waves. Was what was, I remember it said 30 metres, but that's 100 feet waves. He was never heard of again. And the, the thing about what, what really sticks in your mind, I don't I think, have, have you been in an ATC centre? I have indeed, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah well, but, but, but there's always a hum. Yes. Just the fans in, in the machinery is going, but even they seem to stop. There was just absolute, there was other aircraft on the frequency, and obviously they'd held off because this guy was in trouble. But the silence after he went in was deafening, seriously deafening. Now, obviously, things did start up again, but there was that minute where nobody said anything. Is he or isn't he gone? On, on a, a, I suppose, a, a less serious idea too, there's the the poor f- student on their cross-country loses their, their <laughs> sense of where they are and pops out a little call, <clears throat> I am... Currently unsure of my present position. Have you heard a few of those? <laughs> I've heard a few of those, yeah. Yeah, I've heard a few of those. And usually, uh, if you can get them either high enough that you can get them on prime, you know, if, if you, we go back to 70s and, you know, late 70s, early 80s, when really primary radar was always, uh, mm. was always available to, the, to, to, to these students because most of them didn't carry transponders. I mean, even fellas driving cars now carry transponders, but back then they didn't. Uh, so you have to get them to climb. And they were afraid to do that because they might go into cloud. No, you, you, you couldn't let them do that, obviously. Yeah, if you got them high enough that you could see them, then you could identify them. I suppose what leads me on to, to say that to you is, is that, uh, you know, that I was talking to some pilots recently and they talked about a, sometimes a general nervousness about reaching out to ATC, almost, you know, as if you're part of the pun, staying under the radar. Well, when, 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 I, when I was in Knock, 
obviously there wasn't an awful lot happening there, and you got to meet pilots, they'd come up and say hello, say hello to you. And the number of pilots who told me they never talked to APC, this is the first time they'd ever seen an air traffic controller, and how about light aircraft pilots? Mm, yes, of course. And um, so I kind of made it a point, I got involved then with doing the air shows around the country, and I kind of made it a point never to cut the boots off a pilot. I mean, he's under, he has enough pressure going on. I'll always be safe. I'm on the ground. I have a microphone in my hand. I'm on the ground. And if, if you pardon the expression, if the shit hits the fan, he's the one who's going to suffer, not me. Yes. So there's no point in rattling his cage too much. Fine, if you have a serious problem that does need addressing, I would always ask him to come over to the, you know, you know that we got involved with with them, helicopters in and out of different places. I'd ask him to come over and have a chat with me. I just, just listen, I want to talk to you for a minute. Casually, and I'd say to him, listen, well, next time will you do it this way? Because, uh, um, you know, you're putting me in an awkward position. Yeah. They enjoy what they do. I go to the air show, to the fly-ins, and I enjoy looking after them. And that the more that are there, it's, it's, a, it's an ego trip. and the, It's an adrenaline rush when, when you're really hopping there. Mm. And when you're hopping, I mean, I remember being in Bor, you know Bor, when there, were, there was a cross runway. And I'd put the tail draggers on the short runway going down towards the road, and I'd put the tripods on one eight going down towards Ross Gray. And I'd be standing in the middle there with a microphone in my hand and I'd be looking both ways, and it was just an adrenaline rush. It's, at a, t- it's a time like that, though. You want the pilots to uh, not second-guess you. And that's where a lot of it comes from. And the other part of it is phraseology. If you, if you throttle back on the speed of delivery, get your phraseology correct, you won't have to repeat so the last thing you want to hear when you're hopping is, sorry, Shannon, say again, please. <laughs> you, you mentioned earlier uh, some of the events, and, and I'm just, uh, I suppose I want to acknowledge the Ryder Cup, the K-Club. Just set that up for people who might know how that happened. And what was the flow of activity? I, I mean, it was a bit of a world, world record event, wasn't it? It was, it, was a, it was a world record event. We had huge, I, mean, I think it was 186 now, others would know better, but I, I have that figure in my head. No, I have that Helicop- figure here too, 186 helicopters, yeah. Mil- registered, for mul- registered for multi-trips. So they were in and out all day long. So we would arrive out, out in, in, in the cave shop when we were across the road from the cave shop, probably about seven, half seven in the morning. And uh, our breakfast would arrive about nine o'clock. And at one o'clock, our lunch would come and they'd take our breakfast away because we hadn't had time to, to, to do it. And at about three or four o'clock, they bring over another cup of tea and they take our lunch away. It was manic. Uh, and when I say also by myself and Tony Merrigan, and you know Tony as well, mm-hmm. we were inside in what we call the chip van, which is just a... a yes, a indeed, cabin. I know it, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, Shay's wife, Jean, was there, said, trying to keep up with the number of fellas that were landing and taking off. I mean, it, it, it. Now, Tony was great. Tony was doing the strips and he'd be putting his fingers here and everywhere and he'd bring in new strips and taking out old strips. We were landing them five abreast. We were taking them off five abreast. But I happened to be had the microphone in my hand and it was clicking the microphone. Now, bear in mind, it could have been 10 or 12 all screaming at me for directions. And I just fl- flicking the microphone like you would, you know? And a button flew out of it. <laughs> no, now here I am with a microphone in my hand that I couldn't use, the button on the floor, and the, 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 the chairs everywhere, and me on my hands and knees trying to find it and keep talking to these guys at the same time. Brilliant. Well, the things we did, it was just many. You've no radar. You've strips of paper. So what's in your head? Is it, is it a, a three-dimensional picture? Is it, what do you see in your head? If you go back then to the 70s when we trained, effectively we had no radar. Mm. There was a radar backup. But uh, if you were a bit worried about the, separate, the procedural separations, which were 10 minutes longitudinal separation, 15 degrees lateral separation outside 30 miles, uh, or thinking of whatever, whatever else you had going on, 2,000 feet above 29,000 feet or 1,000 feet below 29,000 feet. Um, you turn to the guy and you say, uh, are they all right? And he put down the red thing, you know, yeah, they're grand. He put the thing back up again. But you were trained to build up on the inside of your forehead a moving 3D picture of what was going on. And at any one time, I mean, I couldn't do it now because I'm out of practice. But at any one time, you know, if somebody asked you, where's the shamrock? Which one? 104. He's 70 miles west. He's out of, out of 18,000 feet descending to, to, to uh, 100. 
this was a, without looking at strips. You just had it in your head. Now, I know the strips were there as an aid memoir, but you had it in your head all the time. And the same for, for the Ryder Cup. We didn't have any great responsibility. As a controller in controlled airspace, you're responsible for his separations between ground and other aircraft and anything else to go with. But as a, a operating in an uncontrolled airspace, the pilot is responsible for his own terrain separation, his own separation from other aircraft, to, to, to stay in VFR, in, in VFR conditions. He has all the responsibility. Really, all I'm doing is giving him an advisory sentence. Uh, and to that end, um, you will know from flying around the place, when, when I'm operating in, in, the, in the likes of Burr or Abbey Shrewd or any of these places, it's landing is proved, I give. I won't clear them to land. Yeah. And I'm, I, I really am quite specific about that. That's so, skill, you know, that the, skill that you talk about, the, you know, the, the, the picture on the inside. Of your, it's actually a very good idea for a, a, a VFR pilot to do themselves as well, isn't it? To have that, that picture of who's ahead of you, who's behind you and where you are. You know, I think I said to you recently, the most uncommon thing around the place is common sense. <laughs> Tell me about uh, Adair. You, you met some of the big golfers, I believe. Tiger Woods? <laughs> Yeah, Tiger Woods and, and uh, Ernie Els, Ian Woosnam and, uh, and Chrissy O'Connor Jr. Uh, I remember doing the Cora for the, the Derby. And, the, you know, we were behind the stand and the field behind the stand. And those whole heap of people would come down, not to see the Derby, but to stay in that field just to watch the helicopter coming helicopter? and going. It was like chicken hawk, as someone said all the time. You know, they were just coming uh, and coming and coming. And I have a statistic for you, actually. It's written down here in front of me uh, that uh, for the K-Club, it was 20 controllers in Dublin, five will band Donald, and the two of you in the in the chip van. So there's their numbers for you. You were hot. Retired 10 years, is it? Well, do you know what? I remember when I started, uh, the figures given was 40 years or uh, uh, six, 60 years of age. You could try at 60 years of age. So long as you had 40 years service. And I kind of, I don't know why I got that into my head, but anyway, that's the way it was. And um, I started on the, the 6th of July, 1970, and I finished in August 2010. So I had 60, I had 40 years and about six weeks, and I begrudged them that six weeks. <laughs> Although I thoroughly enjoyed it. Did you enjoy teaching? Yes, I did. There was great. Uh, satisfaction in watching people coming through. Having said that, on the other side of the coin, not everybody got through, and that I found difficult. There was no option, but you had to do it. But it was difficult. I mean, you could not, in conscience, send a fellow up to to, um, operations and say he's okay if he wasn't. The the consequences would have been just horrendous. You couldn't do that. So, I mean, while you accept it, some guys weren't going to make it. They didn't like doing it. I mean, it was great pleasure Sending a fella forward to the next stage of his development, I helped him, and I did. You know, you did your bit. Having said that, I, I did. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the school. Of that. You do, but play. You play a bit of golf still. Well, I continue playing golf. I am involved with the with the juniors here in Drumall and Castle, and the juniors. I was uh, last weekend. I was over in East Clare Golf Club with the, the whole heap of juniors. I, you know, I've, I've seven grandkids, and inevitably, uh, what are you doing today? That will you mind June from you? Will you mind? Uh, um, Jackson, or will you do this, or will you do that? And Final question for you, DV. Um, did you ever think of flying yourself? Uh, not a lot. I do remember when I was a knock. A fella called John. My mother got to go to it. It was alive. And uh, um, she came up to see me. John Cowell said, sure, why don't we go for a spin? And my mother was horrified. That, that was in the not, um, uh, So we put her in the back, and I he said, you come on, DV, you get in there, and you can fly. He turns her at one stage, and goes, isn't he flying it very well? Well, my mother nearly died, but she enjoyed, I mean, she didn't want to come down. And it's one of those things that I still look back fondly and say, I did that for my mother and she enjoyed it so, so much. Mm. It was brilliant. It was just great to be able to do that for someone who appreciated it so much, you know. Only recently, uh, in the the last, we say, six months, we've had quite a number of our, our colleagues have unfortunately passed away. Mm. And that seems to be getting ever more regular. Sure. So, anyway, Im- it's important that people tell their stories and keep in touch with yeah, the members yeah. as well. DV, thank you so much for joining us on Squawk 7000. As good to me, Marcus. Mahabari.
To get the news first, subscribe now to Squawk 7000 on your favourite podcast platform.